Listen, I'm gonna be straight with you. I've seen the happening an embarrassing number of times, mostly because I keep trying to figure it out. It's so weird. It's like if a movie was beamed out to space, intercepted by aliens, who then did their best to recreate what they saw, and then sent that attempt at a movie back to us. But every time I watch it, I'm just as entertained. So let's run like the wind from the wind as I run down why I love the happening. Cheese and crackers. Okay, I know what you're thinking. Is this some kind of joke? The Happening is a terrible movie. And it is. It really, really is. Mother of God, what kind of terrorists are these? But sometimes, like a teenager in love with the troublemaker from the wrong side of the tracks, you just find yourself drawn to movies that are bad for you. So, let's get this started. Number one, Mark Wahlberg. The Happening wouldn't be half the glorious train wreck it is without Mark Wahlberg at the center. It's one of the best did he know or didn't he performances of all time? I need a second, okay? Why can't anybody give me a goddamn second? How does an actor read the opening classroom scene and not immediately say, what? Should be more interested in science, Jake. You know why? Because your face is perfect. And what Oscar-nominated thespian could turn in a scene like this? The toxin? The toxin is affecting them? Every choice Mark Wahlberg makes is the right slash wrong one, leading up to the piece de resistance, my favorite reaction in movie history. Planning on stealing something? No, ma'am, we're not. Plan on murdering me in my sleep? What? No. But there's one clue that says to me that Mark Wahlberg knew exactly what he was doing. Shortly after talking to a plastic tree, talking to He then sniffs a glass of plastic wine, which to me is a sign that says, yeah, I know what I'm doing. Just shut up and enjoy the ride. We just have to be alive when it's over. Number two, Zoe Deschanel. As convinced as I am that Mark Wahlberg knew what he was doing, I'm just as convinced that Zoe Deschanel maybe didn't even read the script before shooting her scenes. Sometimes it seems like she's being fed her lines through an earpiece while being asked to emote as little as possible. Which species do you think is doing it if you think it's true? Other times I think M. Night Shyamalan just filmed her doing a bunch of reactions and dropped them into the movie randomly. You like hot dogs, don't you? And other times she just seems frozen, paralyzed by a director who's left her completely in the dark. Regardless, her awesome confusion, when paired with Mark Wahlberg's earnest incompetence, makes for an unbeatable combination. Number three, exposition. All movies need exposition, the dirty work that involves telling the audience what's going on in the movie. Are you telling me that you built a time machine out of a DeLorean? Some movies do this very well, hiding their exposition under character beats or using tried and true methods like montage, flashbacks, or voiceover. Get to live the rest of my life like a schnook. Other movies are The Happening, where every once in a while M. Night Shyamalan just turns the movie over to random people. They're not sure it's terrorists now. Oh my God, look at this. My sister sent it to me. Whatever this is, it looks like it's not occurring about 90 miles from here. If we go west, we'll hit a county called Arendelle. Hardly anybody lives out there. There's no significant population there. But in a movie that's about the end of the world, you're eventually going to run out of random bystanders to tell you the plot. Luckily for the happening, there also happen to be plenty of TV news reports. This new neurotoxin is basically flipping the preservation switch. The toxin is a natural compound. The event appears to be limited to the Northeast. The event should be at its most sensitive tomorrow morning. This was an act of nature, and we'll never fully understand it. Abandoned cars with working radios. Why aren't they looking into nuclear power plants? There are 15 or more in the Northeast alone. And radios just tied to a fence. All those still inside the affected area of the Northeast are asked to proceed to the police borders. Listen, on one hand, M. Night Shyamalan is a talented writer and director, an Oscar nominee for Best Original Screenplay, and he definitely knows what he's doing, way more than just some schmuck sitting in a spare bedroom converted into a home studio. On the other hand, no he doesn't, and this movie is dumb. Why are you giving me one useless piece of information at a time? What's going on? Number four, writing. Yeah, I'm not done with the script yet because the screenplay for The Happening is patient zero for this cinematic calamity. And it has some of the weirdest lines ever committed to film. Look, I don't know if you guys have heard about this article in the New York Times about honeybees vanishing. It makes you kill yourself. Just when you thought there couldn't be any more 
evil that could be invented. It also has some very odd dead ends, like Mark Wahlberg stopping his class and the movie for no reason. Hey guys. A callback to a line of dialogue that never existed. I'm gonna tell you something. You should never tell your best friend. Why is everybody saying that? Yeah, no one said that for the entire movie. And my personal favorite, the decision for Mark Wahlberg to treat us all to a 1974 Doobie Brothers classic. We're fine right now. Nothing's happened out here yet. On Blackwater, keep on rolling. Mississippi moon, won't you keep on shining on me? See? Maybe it's just me, but randomly breaking into K. Billy's Super Sounds of the 70s would convince me to definitely not let you into my house. Number five, syntax. Okay, okay, one last thing specifically regarding the script and its use of syntax, which by the way, is how a writer chooses to arrange words and sentences. And there are weird usages of both in this movie. For example. I know baby, I know she got out. She's headed to the town of Princeton. Yeah, most people would just say Princeton. We have to go through this little community of homes. Okay, most people would say neighborhood or these houses or even community, but let's continue. Ain't no time. Two people staring at each other, standing still, loving both their eyes at the same time, equal. Yeah, I don't really know what that sentence was. You don't want to be late for the first day schools are open. Again, most people would just say first day of school. But this Kang and Kodosian reading of the English language doesn't just stop in the movie, it extends to the credits, where two actors are credited as student named Laura and student named Dylan. Again, most people would just say Laura and Dylan, but I want this naming convention to catch on. I'm actually I'm actually excited to rewatch The Dark Knight starring Christian Bale as hero named Batman and Michael Caine as butler named Alfred. Number six, the cough syrup scene. Everything we've talked about so far culminates in the most random scene in the movie where Mark Wahlberg attempts to prank his wife, who's just been caught in a tiramisu related cover up with another man. We ate tiramisu together. That is it. By telling her that he almost bought cough syrup from an attractive lady in the drugstore. I was in a pharmacy a while ago. There was a really good looking pharmacist behind the counter. I went up and I asked where the cough syrup was. I didn't even have a cough. And I almost bought it. First of all, great prank, bro. I'm talking about a completely superfluous bottle of cough syrup. Second of all, everyone is very much in mortal danger, which makes the timing impeccable. That's like six bucks. And finally, let's watch these two aliens react to this little ruse. Are you joking? Wow. Number seven, good horror. One of the most baffling things about this movie and M. Night Shyamalan in general is that in the midst of all the weirdness, there's actually some pretty effective horror beats mixed in. These construction workers jumping off a building make for a really creepy visual, as do these landscapers who use their equipment to hang themselves. And this guy starting a lawnmower and laying down in front of it is creepy as well. The concept of a virus that makes you kill yourself is actually pretty solid. It's just that in this movie, everything else is, well, not. Number eight, bad horror. As if to prove my point, when the horror is bad in this movie, it is deliciously bad. Let's start with the fact that we're presented with a situation wherein we have to watch our heroes literally run from nothing. Let's just stay ahead of the wind. Here it comes! Not the most effective boogeyman. The first rule of horror is to have a great bad guy. The second rule is to give the audience the satisfaction of defeating it at the end. But the happening just decides to resolve everything silently and off screen. The event must have ended before we went out there. Stellar combination. But even without a good villain or a big ending, a horror movie can still be compelling if it kills characters that we care about. And the happening also doesn't do that. Open the door, bitch! Show your faces! Let the gas in. No! This really hits the trifecta of the audience barely knowing who they are, barely caring who they are, and barely liking who they are. Listen, we just want some food for a little girl, you pussies! Number nine, math. John Leguizamo is in this movie for two reasons. To have sudden and inexplicable mood swings. Come on, this is some weird event. That's all, we're all gonna be fine. I got her, Julie. I'm gonna take my daughter's hand unless you need it. And to spout math facts like a human PSAT prep course. The probability of something happening in Philadelphia is very low. 62% chance. 62% chance he hasn't even been hit. How much would you have if I said I would pay you a penny on the first day? 
and then two pennies on the second, and then four pennies on the third day, and I just kept doubling, and I did this for a month. And when he's out of both, he just dies. Say what you will about M. Night Shyamalan, at least he's efficient. Number 10, side characters. As much as I love our leads, it must be acknowledged that The Happening also has the most oddball collection of side characters of any movie I can think of. That's one reason I like to rewatch it so much. Every 10 minutes or so, we briefly meet another random person straight out of a David Lynch movie who crashes into our characters. There's Mr. and Mrs. Hot Dog. You know, hot dogs get a bad rap. They got a cool shape, they got protein. You like hot dogs, right? The love child of Buster Bluth and Barney Fife. Nobody's going anywhere. We're gonna stay right here for a while. The murder twins, who I mentioned before. Open the door, bitch! And of course, Cabin in the Woods Lady, who starts off suspicious of Mark Wahlberg's intentions toward her citrusy beverage. Why are you my lemon drink? Does her best to enforce good juvenile nutrition. Don't touch things that aren't yours. Gives Mark Wahlberg a career highlight moment. What? No. Then dies by headbutting a window. And I didn't even mention Principal Cameron from Ferris Bueller's Day Off or student named Dylan. Global warming. Number 11, The Happenings. I think somewhere deep in the recesses of his own mind, M. Night Shyamalan knew this wasn't going to work because sprinkled throughout the script are relentless uses of the word happening as if through force of will. He could redefine the word to become synonymous with the imagined horrors of this movie and not, well, the actual horrors of this movie. There appears to be an event happening. There's something happening in a few states. Whatever's happening is happening to smaller and smaller populations. Why is this happening? Whatever's happening. Could this really be happening? It's happening here. Along with new end credits naming conventions, can we also adopt this for future horror films? Because I want to see Nancy's dad referring to some nightmares on Elm Street, or Ed and Lorraine Warren wax poetic about some conjurings going on at the old Peabody farm. Because wherever that does happen, we can say we remember it happening in the happening, and then happening again when it happens. Number 12, behind the scenes. Okay, this is kind of cheating, which is why I saved it for last, but if you get the chance, I highly recommend any behind the scenes materials you can find about the happening. There's a blooper reel that actually isn't a blooper reel, just outtakes from behind the scenes interviews. Come, should, should, should I? <laughs> Shut up, man, we're doing something over here. Also, it's obvious that almost all of the behind the scenes stuff was shot on one day, which happened to be Tween Murder Day, and features M. Night Shyamalan's original, more gruesome idea for Tween Murder. We're gonna earn that R, we've earned it. We're ready to go. Oh, and it is really apparent that nobody really knew what the hell was going on. Why would we be asking for food if the place is boarded up and nobody's lived here for a long time? What makes you think there's fresh groceries? <laughs> Two words. Canned goods. Which is how a movie like The Happening occurs. So those are just some of the reasons why I love The Happening. Are there any terrible movies that you love? Let me know in the comments below. And if you want even more stuff like this, you can check me out on Patreon, where you'll get early looks at the videos I post here on YouTube, along with even more stuff like film commentaries, my monthly movie club, a Patreon exclusive live stream, and more. Thank you so much for your watching of this video. I'll see you again on the site of YouTube. Until next time, I am Critic Named Dan. Goodbye.